Welcome back to the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Today's episode is part two of the, our interview with the former Speaker of the Legislative Assembly, David Carter. So, hope you enjoy. Besides this, there we go. Um, so, we, we left off with you talking about the combative nature that is the uh, media and the representatives. Um how much do you believe that played a role in your deciding to leave uh, provincial politics in 93? Well, it was but one uh, one element. No, as I said before, the media have their job to do, and that, that's great. Fair enough. It would be appreciated if they did a lot more homework on the issues instead of just as I mentioned, the Calgary Herald editorial board, they decided they could do whatever they wanted. They didn't care about the truth. So it was just one element of the whole situation. No, uh, as I, again, elected four times, hey, I wasn't going to be there for life. It was an interesting life while I was there. But no, I had other things to do with my life. You know, if I... As with many in the MLAs, you spend most of the year away from your family and oftentimes a long distance away, you know, so life goes by back on the ranch, back on on the other towns a little bit where you came from. Well, the other thing was, uh, there was also a change in the political climate. Uh, once Mr. Klein was elected, uh, Things uh, deteriorated considerably, and uh, no, it was time to go do other things, but in particular the family. So there were a number of us uh, who decided that enough was enough. I think of one friend, Alan Highland. He decided to leave, and in passing years, he ended up as uh, the mayor of Bow Island. Done a wonderful job. So those, that's but one example of others who. Uh, decided to come back and work out their civic responsibilities uh, back closer to home. Again, I'd seen enough of uh, having been uh, involved so much with all party uh, facilities that I, I could still continue as a, you know, as a student of democracy and having traveled to other jurisdictions in the world especially the Ombudsman Conference, which I uh, attended in Sweden and Finland uh, with the Ombudsman, and also uh, Grant Motley was riding with us when we went into Russia. You know, this is the days before the Iron Curtain was lifted. Well, it was time to do other things, and uh, since then I've written, altogether I've written about 18 books on history, Western history, and I, I still don't, you know, I still want to preserve what's happened on the Van Nuysen pages. Of course, in particular, the one book that I've sold over 17,000 copies is my prisoner of war book, uh, which dealt with all the prisoner of war camps in Canada, both First and Second World Wars. Now, I published that way back in 1980. And then I enlarged in 96, 90, yeah, after I left politics. And uh, I'm still uh, helping with research students around the world uh, in the follow-up to all that. And in particular, that book that I'd written, I was the first book to have written about the internment of Ukrainian uh, civilians. And it was out of that that eventually the Ukrainian community and other folks from the Central Europe were able to then dig deeper into their own history and have done a marvelous job, marvelous job. Same thing is true with our, our wonderful friends, uh, Japanese uh, Canadians, who also were treated maliciously in the Second World War, but they themselves have written one, uh, excellent histories about all that had taken place with them. So it's, you know, other things to do with my life. And of course, on a pastoral nature, whether it's, you know, at 
That continues to this day. And out here in the Cypress Hills, my wife and I and a number of volunteers, we've restored an abandoned little country church, which also was used as a schoolhouse in the 40s. So again, uh, it's a tourist attraction in many ways. Again, if you access through my book, you know, David, David J. Carter dot CA. And in uh, two days ago, November the 11th, we unveiled for the first time a cenotaph here in this cemetery, which is close to my house. We even had a piper, so we can mark um, the fact that we have about 19 to 20 veterans buried here, and they served in various conflicts and all around the world. So politics is not everything. And as I said earlier, I still maintain my neutrality uh, as speaker so that if any issues come up with parliaments or legislatures, I'm free to comment, uh, you know, and I don't need to apologize for the fact that I, I'm able to quote parliamentary procedure more than I can quote uh, biblical verses because there's so many different versions of the Bible these days, publications. So we are coming up to 30 years since you left elected office in 1993. 2023 would be 30 years since you departed. Have you missed mm-hmm. it? Because you you have been an observer of politics, I'm assuming, watching uh, Question Period, watching House proceedings from coast to coast to coast. Have you missed it? Do you miss it? Or are you comfortable looking back on those 14 years in office and thinking to yourself, I made my mark, I did what I needed to do, and I left at a time when I felt comfortable instead of being pushed out? I don't, I don't miss it. I valued it highly. And as mentioned, I still stay on top of it. Um, if I'm watching question periods right away, I can tell whether the speaker has been doing his homework. And I can also quote parliamentary procedure right away. So my wife will just get up and leave the room. <laughs> you know, and that's part of it. I, I, it's incumbent upon every MLA and every member of parliament. They have to read the rules and then understand what the rules really mean. And it's fine because you still have, you know, far better than in the United States. You have a far more reasonable chance to be able to state your position under the British parliamentary model, which we continue. Now, it was an interesting slice of life, but I do still watch it. And some days, yes, I do shake my head. And I really wish that, as mentioned earlier, that lawyers, political scientists, as well as the elected people, would pay attention to what the real basis foundation of our democracy is. And it's not just whatever comes off the opinion of the top of your head. So I, I got to f- ask the, the million dollar question that a lot of people like myself ponder to themselves on a regular basis. What's wrong with our politics today? Because you are right. People, politicians from all parties, from all levels of government don't know the rules like, say, they did in the 80s and the 70s and even in the 60s, because it was required learning and required reading to be up on the parliamentary procedures of the legislature, of the parliament. In your opinion, what do you see that is wrong with politics today? Well, when it comes to uh, the rules of engagement, uh, many people, democracy ends up being based on a decision for consensus for, you know, if you got three people in a room, you got three different opinions, but at least you come to consensus. It's a matter of having respect for each other. And a lot of people were raised, you know, in uh, country meetings, you know, trying to respect whatever the Roberts rules of order were. And those are, that's fine as a basis, but that really is not the uh, be-all, end-all when it comes to parliamentary procedure. Again, in my case, yes, I'm, 
I'm unique. Many people just say I'm plain strange, but that's beside the point. Having had a background in church law, C-A-N-O-N, and a part of church law in which eventually did come the the recording of parliamentary procedure, you know, we go all the way back. So, number one, if you don't study this stuff and keep going back to it, again, as you're well aware, and anybody listening to us, is the fact that we basically have become a very rude society. Uh, what do you mean by that? Sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but what do you mean by a rude society? Because are you talking with the rise of social media? Or are you talking about other issues or underlying? Oh, no, I, I no, no, I, it's, we have all, bec- we've become much more argumentative. We've become much more um, disputive. We don't, you know, just because my opinion is as good as yours, better than yours. Now, and to you, what you see it at the checkout counter at your grocery store uh, or at the bank. How many people are ever bother to say thank you to the, the person ahead? Now, we've become much more of a society in a hurry. Uh, it's not the fault of the media. No, not at all. But it, it's a matter that more and more we're impatient. Also, we're much more again, through social media, that you can get out there and you have a platform to say whatever you darn well please. So it's less, we are impatient. We don't want to spend the time to sit and listen to the point of view of the other person. Now, again, in current politics, uh, uh, the, the American model is defective compared to the British parliamentary system. You know, because they, they never stop politicking. You know, perfect example right now. Now, the point is that we need to respect each other. I, I've had an image in my mind since you and I chatted. That when I sat in the chair, I was honored. I was truly honored to be the speaker of the legislature. You know, when you sit there, there's no desk in front of you to protect you, even visually or mentally. So while you have all that going on and at times doing the most vociferous exchanges and questioning period, I mean, all I had to do was stand. Stand. When the speaker stands, they're all supposed to quiet down. And that was one of the tools, excuse me, one of the the, the way to be able to get bring order and calm back to the legislature. The other thing is I was different because I kept my books there. And I could quote chapter and verse from the parliamentary procedure, and I had the volume right there. I could flip it open. So they knew that I was, you know, what I was saying was indeed the procedure of the House. The other thing is, that in the turmoil of, you know, trying to break in a number of new members in the Alberta legislature, you know, I was also having to break in myself and to find a way forward. I believe that even to this day, decisions from the chair in Alberta, the speaker, I still represent 70% of all decisions and rulings made. But that was because it was a tumultuous time when democracy and the procedures had to become an education. And there are days I know that I would, I would sit in the chair and I'd be, you know, I'd have to deal with like 82 members, plus certain members of staff members and media in the gallery, all, you know, looking at at the chair and the decisions. And I know that, yes, there's no way I could please everybody, and you're a fool to think that you could. And at the end of the day, there's one old saying, other speaking, speakers and I say, sure, it says, if at the end of the day everybody thinks you're doing okay, hmm, you better think twice. And at the end of the day, everybody's <laughs> mad at you. Everybody's mad at you. That probably means you've had a good day in the chair. <laughs> I yeah. can imagine that that is a, a, a saying that a lot of speakers across this country have said that to themselves on a regular basis, hopefully. Um, yeah. I want to go yeah. back to something well, you said just well, recently. Just quickly. 
Okay, just quickly, on Remembrance Day, I know there were times I just sat there and watching what was going on, and I'd take a deep breath, and I'd say to myself, I will not let you demean what so many have died for to make democracy possible in this Canada and Alberta. Okay, go on with your question. My my question goes back to your statement about the American politics. American politics, as you so eloquently said it, was is a continuous politics. There's no governing now in the States. It's more politics 24-7, seven days a week, 365 days a year. There's no off switch. With us being so close to America, have you seen the infiltration of American politics into the Canadian system as you have watched it over the decades? Because I have seen a rise of politics and the decrease in government in our system that I've never seen over the last four years. So over the last decades that you've been watching it, have you seen the infiltration of that system into Canada? Totally. The Americans, you know, there's a lack of civility. There's a lack of professionalism. There's a lack of integrity. There's a lack of willingness to reach a compromise. See, part of the pro- difficulty for our American cousins is that there's so many states and everybody's clamoring. One of the defects, I believe, is also in the way they appoint judges. So it can be extremely partisan how, you know, some judges run for election and it's so extreme as, you know, you could, if you got a, an American president, republic for, or Democrat, they want to do their best at stacking the deck locally. And uh, as with our American friends right now, the, the number of votes depend. Now they're challenging the whole voting system. So again, if there's no respect for the legal process, then all you're going to have is more and more chaos. And uh, yes, it certainly started a long time ago, but in terms of our Canadian situation, it, it has become vociferous, very, very angry. And there's no point for the anger. Again, parliamentary process, when a person asks a question, a member from the opposition asks a question, they're to turn towards the speaker. And you ask through the speaker. Same thing for the government, for the premier or cabinet. They're to turn towards the speaker and speak, Mr. Speaker, through you too. And that's one of the reasons traditionally the distance between the opposition bench and the government bench is two sword lengths. You know, the old, it's also the figurative speech for dueling. Again, when a member from an opposition party, as an example, starts to say, Mr. Getty or Mr. Horsman, right away the chair has to interview and say, no, in this, in this August forum, you speak to the member for Medicine Hat or to the member for Timbuktu. So again, it's to depersonalize. So in that way, then you get away from some of the anger, some of the displeasure, and some of the irritation. Because, you know, when somebody pokes you in the eye with a stick, it's not. It's pretty tough not to respond in like fashion. You you are one of the only people who I've had on this show I can ask this question to. So I'm looking forward to the answer. Oh. Um, yeah, fire, you, fire away! You know all of this. You can ask whatever you want. Oh, that's what I love to hear. That's what I love to hear. So you 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 mentioned question period a lot over the last few minutes, and I want to ask this yeah. question because they they do call it oral questions or question period, but yeah. it is just that we have. I have seen the rise of 
we're going to ask a question. The opposition is going to ask a question and the government is going to respond with something completely different than the question was posed. So the opposition may ask about a certain deal that was struck by the uh, government and the government can respond in any way that they possibly can, because at the end of the day, they don't have to technically answer the question that has been posed. Um, in your time as speaker, did you get frustrated when you heard the government or members or cabinet ministers answering questions that with responses that had no indication of actually listening to the question that was field? You can rest assured they were very attentive listening to what the question was. But you're also correct. It, there's nothing in parliamentary procedure which says you can demand an answer. You can ask the question, but there's nothing in Beauchene uh, or in um, Erskine May in London which says they have to answer the question. So, I mean, that's just simply the way it is. Do you think that hurts our society? Do you think our, that our hurts our democratically elected process because I, and I, I'm not no. trying to uh, bogart the time here because I find this a fascinating conversation. I hate when politicians don't answer questions as a journalist, as a person who hosts this show, it is the worst thing that you could possibly get because they answer with their speaking points and that's it. I want an honest to goodness conversation. I just don't think we get it from politicians today. Yeah, well, uh, I think you've been getting it today. <laughs> I certainly have been. I can tell you that much for sure. Um, okay, look, look. There's also the people that ask the questions. They know what the answer is. If they, if they're really a good politician, they know what the answer really is uh, before they ask the question. Uh, the other thing is. Uh, as a government member, if you ask a question, you better be prepared for getting an answer which you won't like. <laughs> so that's that's all. And the real purpose of people of opposition, you know, whether it's independents or whichever political party, what they're trying to do is stand up and get their not only fifteen minutes in the in the in the sun. They're it, they're trembling to try to get up so nobody on the other side will embarrass them. The other, the other thing is, it's a, there was on this note, it, sometimes, you know, the speaker does what the speaker has to do, and it's really to try to have the, the whole thing flow peaceable, as peaceable as it might be on that day. There was one government member who was the absolute everlasting expert on trying not to answer questions. And that was Dick Johnson from Lethbridge, who was the provincial treasurer. Dick had uh, one of the, probably the best vocabulary that I ever witnessed in the legislature. An opposition member was there, up and asked a question. And uh, the provincial treasurer, he could say, the, give the same answer three times and never use the same word twice. He was, you know, so as, 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 as a wordsmith, which you are, so am I as an author. I mean, I was just, it was, it was the best I could do just to keep a straight face, because just to see how you can mesmerize, and you could start to see the member who would ask the question, you could see his eyes glaze over. No, uh, it was good. There was interesting times, and the, right now I'm I'm downsizing my 80s legal size final boxes of, of material, uh, and I, it's wonderful to see what's coming up on that one stage. I'm saying, boy, wasn't that an interesting time, and how the heck did we all get through it together? <laughs> I can imagine that while Dick Johnson is probably one of the good ones, you probably did see some bad ones as well who stumbled over themselves every time they tried to answer a question as well. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, very much so. But again, as a as a speaker, as I've mentioned more than once, I'm there to protect 
the rights of each member in that house. Then no matter which constituency or which political party, you're there to defend each member of the house. Whereas an opposition party, the government, no, they try they're busy trying to promote their particular schedule. No. You think you did that? Like it, looking back as your term as speaker, those 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 years as speaker, do you think you protected the uh, the members and the decorum that was set within the legislature during your time as speaker? I've come across uh, two comments uh, in that research again as I'm sorting through it. There was one letter from a former member from the Social Credit Party who'd been in the House for 37 years. And then he, he said, and this is written at the time, you know, in this first go around with a, all the whole new members and, and a very combative kind of situation. He, he, he said, Carter's the best speaker I've seen in 37 years. Wow. Then I had another fellow who had been in the cabinet. He had been, and he had been out of politics for a good twelve years. And there was another letter. This is during that old period with the uh, Edmonton Journal, the Edmonton Sun, the Calgary, all the rest of them were really hammering my decisions because again they hadn't done the homework as to what a speaker can do and the rules he must employ, he or she. And he said, and this cabinet minister said, boy, it's, he's, he's doing the best job I've ever seen as a speaker. However, I, I know that uh, from, from other sources across the country, and as well as within the Alberta legislature, I was, well, the other speakers couldn't believe that I was as fair and and knew what I was doing. Now we had that in conferences. Anyway, it boiled down to the comment which I take uh, to my heart is I was known as the toughest, fairest speaker in all of Canada at that time. Are you proud of that? Are you proud that you were known as that? Uh, I'm sitting here toughest, fairest, most knowledgeable. Yeah, I haven't, uh, yes, I haven't said that to anybody, but I guess now through you, I've, I've said it to a lot of people. I'm uh, still amazed, still thankful I was there, and I know I did it out of loyalty and integrity. And uh, yeah, it warms my heart. You, Thank will, you. you will go down in history because you are the not only the ninth speaker of the Legislative Assembly, but you have your official portrait within the Legislative Assembly. So anyone who visits mm -hmm. the building will see your face until our great world goes and is gone. Your portrait will be hanging in the walls of the Legislative yeah. Assembly. Looking back at your time, looking at the future of the, the democratic process and the Legislative Assembly, you will be known as speaker for the remainder of your life. Does that give you some um, credence that you've left a mark on this world that some other people may not be able to? Well, it's just a statement of fact. But every person has a story. And every person has made a mark on on some on their family and friends. And in different ways, you know, but each no matter to what degree it's valid for them. Now when I look at that uh, <laughs> I remember I think it was my dad when I told him about the portrait being hung, he said, oh, David, I'm sure there are lots of people who wanted to hang you anyway. And he was right. Uh, 
Well, it's a great experience, and I, 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 uh, I invite you to do something for me, pretty please. The next time you're in your legislature, and you go past that portrait of that young guy, <laughs> uh, run your finger on the lights to make sure they've taken all the dust off, <laughs> because there's a lot of dust on me right now. Uh, um, I, I, I want to turn to our, my last segment, and that is the future. Uh, since 1993, you've written books. You have settled in uh, the south uh, eastern corner of our great province. You have uh, commented on politics through your uh, channels. I've read a few uh, newspaper articles and a few media reports of some conversations you've done since uh, leaving politics, but not a lot. Um what's next because you're talking about downsizing but what's next for david carter the former speaker of the legislative assembly <laughs> what what's next well i hope hope my health continues you know for 88 and a half uh, as my wife said the other day you know you're in pretty good shape for 88 and a half i said yes because uh 70 of my friends who are 88 they're now dead uh, well, we continue. Uh, I'm doing more research on prairie history. I'm, and again, uh, for the friends, we keep maintaining. I do all the uh, paper organization and stuff for the cemetery next to the house. So I'm selling grave plots. Another one of my friends who was in the advertising business said, use this line, shop early for best selection. Anyway, where I am, I can look out the window and I see my family plots where my friends, my daughter, my parents, and others are buried. And I'm privileged to live in the Cypress Hills. There are no neighbors within a, a mile of me. Well, my neighbors are, are coyotes and elk and squirrels and uh, lots of white-tailed deer. And this uh, abandoned church we've turned into a, a, a beautiful little park. The door is never locked. We have about 4,000 visitors come through the site in a year. And it's known uh, across as far away as England, all across Canada, into Germany, down into the States. Uh, if everybody can visit via the net to St. Margaret's. Eagle Butte, and then I'm also a caregiver for my dear wife. So one day at a time is good, and I thank God each and every night. I do indeed. It's been a tremendous life so far, and I'm not done yet. Same thing is true for you. Certainly, certainly is right. Um, I want to ask this final question and then we're, we'll wrap up here, David. And that is looking back, you've had an amazing career. You have graced the halls of power within uh, the Alberta legislature. You have been at the forefront of being the referee of the legislative assembly, the so-called referee of the legislative assembly as speaker of the legislative assembly. You have had an extensive career outside of politics. You have written amazing books. What do you want to be remembered for? For being a father, being a good son, and for being a, a good grandfather, great-grandfather, husband, and friend. Well, I, I we, we rarely we barely know each other, David, but I can tell from just our brief conversation <clears throat> you are a good person. Uh I I, I I'm wow. always impressed when I have these conversations with people and I get <clears throat> learn so much about people. And yeah. I just uh, learning uh, about yeah. you through this conversation has been one of the highlights yeah. of my year. So thank you so much for doing uh, this. Uh, well, thank you. I I'm not a perfect person, for sure. You know, 
Far, far from it. A lot of bumps and bruises in my life, many of which I wish I had never brought upon myself or had inflicted upon me. No, no. But I, I'm a priesthood person, and I thank God each day for for just having been th- through all this, and with which I firmly believe God walks beside each one of us, no matter how you interpret the understanding of God. Anyway, I appreciate you calling. You really put up with a lot. I'm sure your ear is now cauliflower size, and uh, you have demonstrated professionalism and great patience. David, I want to thank you so much for doing this. It's been an honor and a pleasure for me. Uh, I, I'm, I, I, I'm graciously, grac- greatly appreciative of you taking your morning and your day to talk about this. And I want to say to those who are listening, uh, those who are listening at a later date, um, if you want to pick up one of David's books, the links to his website are in the show notes. So please yeah. buy them because some of them are great. I'm looking forward if I can find the one that I'm really looking forward to, I be, I will be buying it shortly. I've been asking around at local libraries and none of them seem to have it. So I will find a copy of it. And David, I want to thank you so much for taking time and doing this. Well, thank you. The only book I still have left in print is the prisoner war book, uh, which is, uh, and it's factual, factual from beginning to end. You talked about Camp 30 in it by any chance? Yeah, it's in the back of the book. Oh, I will be picking up that that then. No, but I I, I come from the community that surrounded Camp 30, so it has always been a a very big uh, moment in our history in Newcastle and Bowmanville, so I will be be buying that book for sure. Well, I know the guys that were in Bowmanville. I, the guy who was shot in Bowmanville camp, he was one of my mentors. And in fact, I went and kissed his forehead in Kiel just before he died. That became my ministry in many ways, which went beyond, you know, beyond the Atlantic. Uh, no, not dear friends. Now you need to send me your mailing address so I can send you that you know, get Carter elected button or so. And do, do you have the prisoner of war book? No, I will be getting that, uh, getting a copy because that's what I wanted to know. Because when you said prisoner of war, I wanted to know if it was about that uh, camp 30. So I'll certainly have to do that. Uh, well, all right. You on email, send me your mailing address. I'll send you a book and uh, one or two of those campaign things. So with that, I want to thank everyone for tuning in for another episode of the Great uh, Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. And remind everyone, put down social media, put down Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and all that other social media stuff, and your phone, and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our democracy, helps our society, and helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. Have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. <laughs>